Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Libraries in Response. It's been uh, a couple of months, actually, since our last session. Uh, we, well, we just took a long summer break this year. Uh, I'm just back from uh, a month in the mountains of northern New Mexico uh, camping out. So I'm, I'm having some culture shock here back in the Bay Area with masses of automobiles <laughs> and people. But um, it's great to be back. We're looking for, forward to an uh, uh, exciting set of uh, sessions this fall. We're lining them up right now. We're going to kick it off today with um, uh, a kind of an introductory uh, session on this uh, topic of library diplomacy, a fascinating idea, which is, well, if you search it, you will, you'll find not much out there under this particular term. We'll dive into that uh, in a second. Uh, this is our speaker, Randolph Mariano, and then Stephen Weiber, our uh, infamous uh, co-host and a fellow uh, uh, producer for the series, the, the head of public policy for IFLA based in The Hague. And thank you, Stephen. Uh, we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. This is an open collaboration of libraries doing what we think are interesting things uh, with technologies, emerging technologies or new uses of existing technologies. And uh, this series began in March of uh, 2020 with the declaration of the pandemic as a response. You know, what's going on? What are what is the impact on on libraries, on communities, on everybody? And it just rolled forward. Uh, now this is uh, session seventy eight, uh, hosted and recorded by IFLA, and uh, we have a new sponsor, IMLS, the uh, the U.S. Federal uh, Library Agency, who's come in to support the series. Thank them very much. Uh, this is becoming kind of a, a go-to slide because I think it just touches the heart of, uh, of libraries. It, it, they're just manifold roles they play. You know, every individual walks in, they request a service. That's a service the library provides. They'll do pretty much anything anybody asks them to do. And uh, that, of course, piles up to be a long list. But the value of having such a flexible public institution free to do and help support any kind of activity that people have and, and request to us is just not only amazing, but it's just wonderfully valuable. And, uh, and of course, underappreciated by many people. I don't know about the majority, since in the US, the majority of the population, or at least half the population, are active library users. So presumably they appreciate this. Uh, the, the other aspect of it, which is of course, uh, gets to the heart of the libraries in response, is the library's role as responder to crises, whether it's personal or regional, local, any kind of scale. Um, we always talk about first responders, you know, health, uh, ambulances and, and firemen and police, in these emergencies, but after those, and in large scale events, they're overwhelmed. And then, then what? What's the, what's the methodology for responding in, well, any extended lights out circumstance, floods, fires, et cetera? Well, there's just not one. I mean, maybe a community has come up with something, but generally speaking, there's not. So we've uh, adopted or you know, bought into this term of second responder, which is, been circulated for a few years now of uh, those institutions and services which are not so-called emergency services but are very definitely involved and so when we pose this we we did a a prior IMLS uh, project a, a grant to to explore this idea of so-called uh, second responders uh, communication network second nets uh, we were we were challenged with the idea, well, why should libraries take on yet another uh, responsibility? And our response was, well, 
like it or not, they're just going to show up at your door. So I'm sorry if it's another thing to to take on, but people will come because they they believe the library is a place where people can get information, they can get help, and so it's natural that they show up there. Uh, these are some of the topics that we're that we're planning. We've touched on these before. They're they're been popular. We're going to do them again. State of the states is a <clears throat> is a, uh, uh, a thread that we've done hosting the state libraries to give briefings on the, the status of uh, libraries in their state. And it's been very well received. We've had, I think we've had like 17, 18 state libraries present uh, last year, I think it was. Uh, and they've been illuminating. You know, so many, so many great stories and practices. We're big fans of, of the state agencies because they're the vector for so much information and for funding. And since the uh, since the Recovery Act, a lot of additional funds have flowed through uh, uh, IMLS, which is what it normally does, is distribute funds to the state libraries. Uh, libraries and AI, this has been probably the hottest uh, topic we've had, as as you might imagine. There's a lot of curiosity about this, a lot of trepidation, some optimism, uh, and but mostly it's been, you know, confusion and lately this kind of fear of impact. Well, I think the good and the bad are all applicable in this field, um, but there is there's a, some interesting new new thinking around this as far as libraries and librarianship and AI. Uh, and we'll be getting into that. It has to do with the prospect for libraries to actually be leaders in the development of AI. Anyway, I'm not going to get into that, but it's it's really fascinating. Uh, uh, adaptation strategies. We've made this point repeatedly that that as far as mitigation goes, there's not much that the individual or the individual institution can do in the context of dealing with this crisis. It's going to take the largest actors, the, the largest states, the, the largest financial institutions to actually engage and cause meaningful uh, mitigation of this disaster, which just continues to unfold. However, uh, uh, the, the companion to mitigation is adaptation and adaptation scales at any level. So we've seen and we'll give more examples of how libraries themselves are adapting and they're leading their communities in adaption adaptation strategies because we're in for it there's just no question about that uh, broadband programs the bead grants uh, uh, state planning this is all very relevant to to libraries and it's a, a opportunity of a moment where there's a lot of funds flowing uh, more than there are actual now, I wouldn't say uses for, but more than there are specific plans for the use of these funds. So the planning is racing out ahead of the uh, now appropriated funds, large amounts of funding. And uh, the libraries, uh, as we've had a session before, uh, need a seat at the table because they represent the interests of more people than any other institution. Broadband from space is uh, also a topic we've dealt with. The emergence of new, a uh, new era of satellites is, is changing how we think about this this particular uh, internet access service. In low Earth orbit, uh, the the satellites perform much better. the The time delay between going way out to the previously uh, the only actual communication satellites out at geostationary orbit is is just too slow. The speed of light is not fast enough to get signals out 22,000 miles, 35,000 kilometers or so, and back again without a significant delay or lag. Um, and so uh, this is this is really an interesting topic, something we've been exploring. It's kind of in our wheelhouse because we've focused on emerging communication technologies for years. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I've been offered, uh, invited to present, uh, to lead a discussion, uh, a session group at the International Govern Interna Internet Governance Forum in Kyoto uh, mid next month. And that's the title of the session. And we'll be 
hearing from various users and providers of these new services. Telehealth uh, is, is really something interesting at the same time, uh, especially in rural areas, uh, clinics are closing, hospitals are closing, and people are less and less served. And yet everybody needs more services, or especially as they age. And telehealth has come in. I mean, the pandemic just brought it solidly into the into the mix of, of uh, how we get uh, receive services from from healthcare providers. Well, uh, that does eliminate uh, distances. It's not quite the same as being in person, but it's a long way from nothing. And libraries have uh, embraced this role and have set up uh, environments for people to come in and have some privacy in a facility uh, with uh, you know high performance communications and perhaps other equipment. Lifelong learning is kind of self-explanatory. It's, uh, it's the game we're all in and libraries are the perfect place for that since they serve, you know, cradle to grave as it were. So tune in for those. <clears throat> uh, we, as I mentioned, we started with COVID, the, the pandemic. And so, you know, that was kind of int very intense at first, right? We just didn't know. Everybody was hunkered. Well, I'm not going to review the whole thing. But you remember. Uh, and then suddenly it, it was over. It seemed like it was over. Well, it's back. And there's a new rise now and a new variant that seems extremely contagious. And we don't know quite what the impact is, but you know, the, we're still on this this thing. It, it, it never actually left, but people wanted to pretend that it did. Uh, this, as I mentioned, is the major a major topic that we're all dealing with. It's one of the this is relevant to today's topic, but uh, I'll touch on that. This is our our little graphic on the varieties of disaster that are occurring here now on a a weekly basis. Uh, I don't think I have to tell you. And then libraries and AI. This is really important. This is this is this has been likened to a change um, uh, comparable to the arrival of the web, which changed everything. Right. I mean, our our civilization has completely altered itself to operate through this digital communication network, and now AI is involved as a new player player not just a medium but an act an actor uh, and what does that all mean well we're gonna we're gonna talk about that so here we are today uh our special guest is randolph mariano uh i hope you had a chance to look at uh, randolph's uh paper uh it's not actually his paper he there's an article his paper is due uh i believe in the next couple of months uh, he's agreed to come on early with us today and and give us a preview and a briefing on it, kind of the background and why he how he discovered this or or decided to devote himself to this particular concept, uh, and uh, and then what it what it may mean. What uh, I mean, uh, Randolph is taking, of course, an academic approach to describing this, which is you know really fascinating. <laughs> And then we're also, of course, interested in well, what's the application of that, and, and how how could we, as not we, you, as librarians or the library world, implement such uh, such a practice, and to what benefit? Uh, certainly, the uh, the world is uh, uh, it's it's an interesting kind of dichotomy. The world is both uh, seemingly kind of coming apart, which is true. But it's also more closely knitted together. This communication network has knitted us all together, much more, I say all, everybody with a connection, which leaves out several billion people still. Uh, but uh, at the same time, we're being kind of pressed together in common interests, like the, the climate crisis would be number one, uh, COVID was a fantastic example, a horrible example, but a really strong example of there's just one place. It's this biosphere that we inhabit that's actually one place and we all share it, uh, like it or not. We, we can divide it, we can pretend we're dividing it, but finally we cannot divide it. It's just one thing. 
and uh, weather and viruses and ideas, they travel all around. So what then is the potential for libraries to affect how that unfolds and deal with some of these new challenges of learning, information, support, service? Uh, leading our discussion today will be uh, Stephen Weiber, our old our old uh, time partner in these series that uh, known to everybody and the head of public policy for IFLA, uh, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, Institutions and Associations, and uh, experienced in uh, international affairs. So that's a kind of a longer introduction than the normal, but uh, I just wanted to review this because it was kind of a restart after a long and happy summer break. So I will stop there. And I will invite uh, Randolph to take over. Randolph, welcome. Thank you so much for taking yeah. the time. Thank and you so much, uh, Don, for inviting me. Um, I'm just going to share screen my presentation so everyone could be able to see right. it. Um, let me check to. Can everyone see it now? Everybody, it's good, great, perfect. Okay, great, perfect. So yeah, thank you so much, um, eFly and um, Gigabit Network for inviting me and um, being interested actually in this topic about library diplomacy. I haven't heard any like association who have um, interest about diplomatic engagement and diplomatic influence, but but when we when we see the world right now, it's quite you know you know, where diplomacy is not working in some areas of this world. Um, in some regions, there's war, there's conflict, right? And um, I feel like we're not living in World War I or World War II, but we are living in a new, you know, Cold War period. That's what, that's what a lot of political scientists are trying to say to us, that, you know, we're living in a, in a different world where digitalization is being used, is being instrumentalized for um, diplomatic engagements and um, diplomatic, um, you know, dialogue with one country to another, either bilateral or multilateral, um, you know, engagement. But but for for this purpose of um, uh, this talk, I'm gonna you know I'm gonna discuss about a little bit about the connection, the intersection between libraries. And diplomacy, because you know, you know, during the World War One, World War Two, a lot of like foreign cultural centers were established by governments. Let's say, for example, the United States, the the British Council, the Alliance Francaise. All of these foreign cultural centers were established worldwide, and the main purpose is to engage with the global public and bring in their innovation and also share culture, share knowledge in the global international sphere. So that is the main purpose during that time. But, you know, in this period, in this contemporary period, why do libraries or why does libraries matter in the new diplomacy area? So the, those are the questions that we're going to answer in this talk. So those are the three questions that I see that probably you're, you're curious about. What is library diplomacy? Why, why does it matter? And how do community of experts and policymakers portray the concept of library diplomacy, which is really important? How do these diplomats or, or, or um, politicians right, um, conceptualize or use or practice the concept of library diplomacy? So this research about library diplomacy, I got interested because I used to work in one of the um, cultural centers of the United States. Although US doesn't have a, for, a form of cultural policy, but um, they have established this, um, what you called American spaces. Probably you're familiar with that. American spaces. So those are the, the, the US information agency formerly known as U.S. Information Agency during, back in the back in the times where there's World War One and Two, and um, it 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 is now um, converted into a, a cool spaces, 
And I used to work with that, American Spaces, and it is uh, under the State Department. It's a project of the State Department to engage with, you know, with the with the global public, with the foreign public, and you know, talk about U.S. foreign policies, and you know, bring in some innovation, and then share it with the global public. So th that is the main purpose of the American Spaces. So I got interested in this research. So, but let's dip dive in the the, the presentation. Um, so I'll divide it into five sections. First is the literature. What does the scholar uh, says about this topic? Number two is the theories, the concepts, and the frameworks being discussed by, by scholars and also with politicians around the world. And then the three, the number three is my research actually. So this is the um this is the, the interview analysis that I uh that I conducted in the United States. What do they think about library diplomacy in the perspective of librarians and the perspective of diplomats, both you know, international relations and library information science field of study. And then number four, policies and of course future research. So um of course we all know what is library and um you know, libraries evolving through time. You know, it was like, you know, during the time of the old period, it is a, a storehouses, it's a knowledge houses, right? But now it's a different kind of um, space. It is a space for engagement. It's a space for not only information, but also engaging with people, engaging with audiences, um, you know, learning with one another, uh, learning through the community. So those are the, the new emerging goals and the motives and values of libraries in today's world, particularly in the 21st century. And then when we talk about diplomacy, this is the, you know, the political scientists version of diplomatic concept. It is about negotiating policies. When we say policy, these are the foreign policies in order to form and create, you know, relationships with one country to another or create relationships or it could be bilateral relationship it could be multilateral treatises rules and agreements and of course to achieve you know understanding and dialogue in the international system and then um this paper that we've wrote together with andreas varheim my supervisor talks about what are the scholars think about library diplomacy, uh, meaning cultural diplomacy, science diplomacy, knowledge diplomacy, museum diplomacy? So this is a scoping review. This is a systematic review of all the scholars from, from the 1900s, 1920 to be exact, up to the present. What do they talk about? And um, these are the goals. These are the goals of, um, of, uh, that, that was discussed by the scholars. First, they use libraries for diplomacy, for cultural diplomacy, or for science diplomacy. It's because they want to pursue national interest. So these foreign cultural centers have their own interests. So their interest is to um, you know, spread um, democratic ideals or spread um, communist ideals during the Cold War period. Or probably they want to promote their national identity. So let's say, for example, Alliance de Francais or British Council, they want to promote British culture or French culture. They want to promote what is Cosson in all over the world, right? So those are the, the motives. And um, so and so forth. There's democratic values. Um, some of the cultural centers, um, they want to promote cosmopolitan values as well. Some of them wants to promote creativity and innovation and so on and so forth. And then we have a couple of like um, studies that we have found. If, if you see it, it's like around the 21st century from 2015 up, up to the present. So they want to promote this freedom of expression about um, freedom of information or the EDIA, equity, diversity, and inclusion and accessibility, human rights. So those are their purposes. Why do they want to engage with diplomatic engagements? So who are the actors involved? So based on the scholars' um, perspective, um, a lot of them says that a lot of people who are involved with diplomacy 
are mainly state actors. Meaning, when we say state actors, it involves, um, you know, librarians working in the State Department or librarians working in the Library of Congress. So they are the state actors. Or probably they are like officers from the Institute of Museum and Library Services, an independent agency that promotes and improves um, library programs and services, right, in the United States. And then a couple of like um, state, a couple of the, the emerging actors that we've seen in the, the paper is the non-state actors, meaning these are, you know, um, IFLA officers, probably IFLA officers or ALA officers or board members wants to promote diplomatic engagement or international engagement with one country to another. So, and also there's a hybrid also of um, actors, there's state and non-state actors as well, working together in creating um, engagement in the international sphere. Strategies. So these are like um, the straightforward strategies that we've seen in the papers. Um, a lot of them, majority is about propaganda. So, but you know, people think about propaganda as a bad thing, right? Because that's what, you know, a lot of like um, um, newspapers are being told to us that, you know, propaganda is a bad thing. But, you know, if, if we try to look at it or theorize or conceptualize the word propaganda, it just means to promote something, promote information, promote foreign policy to promote their own national interests. So, but then again, because of this unbalance, you know, um, interaction or relationship or engagement, there's an imbalance engagement, then propaganda begins bad. So, um, but, but a lot of the propaganda is being done by the state actors. So um, in this papers that uh, we you've seen in the in the, the presentation, those are most of them are U.S. perspective um, analysis on the use of libraries, museums, and cultural centers through propaganda agenda and strategy. And then there's also a couple of like studies that talks about cross cultural relation, meaning it's a two way. It's not just one way communication, but it's a two way communication. There's mutuality. There's like understanding with one, you know, from, from the receiver of information and the sender of information. There's understanding and they share, you know, culture, they exchange information with one another. And then instruments. So um, a lot of them are, of course, books, information and print materials. Some of them are promoting cultural heritage and then majority that we have seen also is the digitalization of like materials. Let's say for example, um, uh, digital resources or um, e-resources or probably data from one country to another. They share data to improve services in their particular countries and regions. So those are like the results and um, yeah. So the concentration of studies talks about that, you know, libraries are just used. So that is the main purpose of the, the, the that paper is to provide evidence that, you know, libraries is just being uh, an instrument or a tool or an agent to create diplomatic engagement for the influence of this US foreign policy or British foreign policy or French foreign policy to other countries. So that is the main purpose. It's always about propaganda, particularly those studies that uh, that were studied are during the, the World War One, the World War II and the Cold War periods and a, li a limited of studies about the post Cold War periods. What is interesting is that there's less about libraries, but more about culture plural diplomacy or museum diplomacy, meaning like how do uh, museums are trying to interact with one country to promote their collection, but less of libraries. And then the third concentration of studies and most, a lot of the, the actors being discussed are United States about the, the, the US foreign policies. And of course, World War II, the Cold War periods, they talk about a lot of traditional libraries being used or an instrument for, for diplomacy. And then, of course, a lot of the agenda is to promote political values. Let's say, for example, democratic values or communist values during the time of the world wars. 
and of course, information transfer as well. So those are the con concentration of ideas. The emerging gaps here that we found in the, that paper is that the use of the term soft power. So when we say soft power, soft power is a, is a concept um, created by uh, Joseph Nye, a really famous, a well-known political scientist that talks about, you know, how do a, how do a particular resource or asset can could attract or an, uh, another country or co-op with other country? Let's say, for example, a good example of soft power would be um, Hollywood, right? So American Hollywood is one of the best example of soft power during the time during the 60s and 70s, where the United States is really famous. It's because of their American pop culture of Hollywood or films, right, being exported in the in the media industry all over the world. So when we so if if you talk about it or if if you go to other countries, let's say for example in Asia, particularly in the Philippines, they know a lot of like you know pop culture in the 70s or Hollywood, it's because that is, a, a, you know, that that culture attracts them. So it becomes a soft power. Um, a lot of diplomats use soft power to, um, it's a combination of a smart power. Let's say, for example, a lot of diplomats use both hard power and soft power to create relationship or build dialogue with one country to another. So they don't just, you know, rely on economic diplomacy. Okay, let's have, you know, treaties as in bilateral relationship. Let's exchange goods and services. But um, in order to gain um, trust with their partners abroad, they use soft power. Let's say, for example, in, in, the, in, the, in, in Korea, they have this K-pop, right? Probably you've heard about it, the Korean pop culture. A lot of like um, young ones today are into BTS, a, a really famous Korean band where, you know, they, they, a lot of like people all over the world wants to go to, the, to Korea to meet their, their fam this famous band. So that is the, the you know, the strategy of the, the Korean government to create attraction and build more uh, relationship with all the countries all over the world. And of course, if you gain attraction, you gain power. You gain power in the international system. So that is soft power. And it, you know, a lot of countries are using culture. They use museums, they use libraries as a soft power asset to create relationship in the international system. Another, another emerging gap that we uh, saw in the, the research is about cross-cultural relations. So, um, but particularly in the museum side. So meaning, um, you know, let's say for example, Mu, uh, Louvre Museum, we're gonna partner with uh, Guggenheim Museum in the United States into a, a, a cross-cultural relationship and exchange of like museum collection, but it is less in the library side. We have it not seen a lot of, um, you know, uh, partnerships, like really big partnerships happening from one country to another. There's a, a couple of that, which is probably you've known about it, the Sister Library Initiative, where um, a sister city public library from this country A, we're gonna partner with a sister city in a country B. So there's like a couple of engagement, like let's say for example, library exchanges or like or or or, or digital you know exchanges, uh, webinars and so and so forth. But it's less. It's uh, museum diplomacy is more famous, well known, particularly in the scholars field. I mean, in the field of research than library diplomacy. And um, there's also new values that we have seen that emerging. Let's say, for example, the promotion of um, global causes. Let's say, for example, equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility. The promotion of, um, of freedom of information or freedom of access to information. The promotion of climate change. The promotion of human rights or you know, using sustainable development goals as a strategy to partner with one country to another or or a library to another library. So those are the new values that we saw in the paper one. And of course, a lot of them are going digital and also using the internet for, for diplomatic engagement.
or what they call as digital diplomacy. So um, in this paper one as well, um, we've saw we've seen that um, there's like a change in the actors. There's an exchange. There's an influence. There's an inform version where the agencies are trying to inform information. There, we've seen that the actors, particularly state actors, they are really into the influence side and negotiating side. And then the non-state actors, let's say, for example, librarians or li library officers in the United States, they are more into working together. Let's say, for example, ALA is working together with other um, library association, let's say, for example, Ukrainian Library Association to build, you know, better libraries. So those are like the, 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 the identities that we've seen in the actors. And also, um, next slide. Why libraries matter in diplomacy? Um, it's because of the importance of data and information. We have seen that um, a lot of actors, they use data now instead of books to create engagement. Um, they use um, data and information and knowledge through um, digital engagement, through the use of the internet, through the use of electronic resources to create relationships or to create dialogue or to create diplomatic you know, influence as well in the international system. Yeah. So the the paper that you know Don mentioned in the in the in the talk is this one, the mapping and searching for a theory and concept of library diplomacy. In this paper, I just discuss all the different types of diplomacies that's being discussed all over the world. So one of which is economic diplomacy. So of course it's very straightforward. They use economic, you know, agenda as a diplomatic skill to advance economic and political strategies and goals. And um, another one that is famous is cultural diplomacy, the use of culture or the use of shared identity to strengthen, strengthen relationships and enhance social cultural cooperation. And of course, a lot of state actors are focused on promoting national interests of their own country. And this one is the emerging diplomacies that we have seen. The use of um, the, the science as a tool, as an instrument to build bridges and enhance relationship among the countries and institutions. Um, it involves scientific collaborations. Let's say, for example, um, talking about um, ocean commons Let's say, for example, um, cooperation in the Arctic region, or probably like you know creating partnerships on um, climate change and all of that stuff. So those are the things, and a lot of actors in the science diplomacy are majority scientists and not diplomats. So those are like the um, emerging actors in the field of science diplomacy, which is really good because you know. Um, if you want to talk about scientific collaboration, if you don't want to politicize scientific collaboration, um, a lot of scientists are in the forefront of creating relationships with in another country instead of like, you know, they are being becoming an instrument of political actors. So which is really quite, you know, good um, environment in terms of like, um, this one-way or two-way communication. And um, there's also emerging diplomacies. Let's say, for example, sustainable development diplomacy is quite straightforward. They want to promote sustainable development diplomacy, this SDG goals. Museum diplomacy as well. So they want to develop, they want to share skills and knowledge. This museum curators, museum professionals. They want to share their skills and knowledge in the international sphere. They want to develop broader understanding about international museums. And of course, they want to attract new audiences in the global public sphere because um, right now we are decentralized. You know, it, it, Louvre Museum is famous all over the world. So even though I'm at home in, let's say for example, I'm in, in China right now, I would be able to access Louvre collection through the internet through digital programs and engagement. So 
Um, these are the ways of museum curators and museum professionals to engage in the diplomatic um, settings. It's because they want to attract new audiences in the global public sphere, which is what I've seen that is less in the library side. Sometimes we, we, um, we solve things regionally. We solve things um, in, in, a, in, in, a, in, in our own country as well. And we don't involve other countries, so we we're we're a bit silos actually. So that's what I've I've seen in the papers that we have wrote, written is that a lot of um, libraries, particularly public libraries and um, and um, uh, state libraries, they're a bit silo. So they just want to solve real world problems in their you know local perspective, which is doesn't have this local and global perspective or being open for you know international collaboration or global collaboration in order to solve real world challenges in the global sphere so but in the museum side they're more ahead on us which is unfortunate and of course in, in my um, conceptualization of library diplomacy it is focused on um, you know the strategies being used by actors and agencies to engage in countries and institutions and um, yeah, so I have this um, uh, the framework, the dimensions of library diplomacy that is patterned with the science diplomacy. So I patterned it with, uh, with the science diplomacy framework. Um, it is the libraries in diplomacy, diplomacy for libraries and libraries for diplomacy. So I conceptualize this, it's because I want to, I want for librarians to realize their worth their assets, their power, actually. Because sometimes libraries doesn't have, you know, they don't realize much about their own power, that they have their own soft power to influence and engage in the diplomatic or global environment. Sometimes librarians are just being, you know, siloed in our four corners of their our library spaces and sometimes we don't want to be involved in the global sphere because you know we have our own problems in our own libraries and we don't want to get more you know more problems in the global sphere but then again um this dimension of li uh, dimensions of um, library diplomacy will help us to realize and also understand why library diplomacy as a concept matters to us as a practitioner and i'm not talking about a re on my research side, side right now as a researcher, but more of a practitioner, right? Because um, it is important that you know we don't just research these things. Uh, we just we it is important, but we also um, apply these things in a practical setting or in a practical world. So, um, first, libraries in diplomacy. When when I talk about libraries in diplomacy, it means that we as librarians are in the diplomatic processes, meaning we are involved in global policies, let's say for example, sustainable development goals, we are involved in international processes or creating cooperations and engagements. Um, it refers to the library actors, including individual librarians or group of librarians or information professionals or leaders in the, this field advocating for foreign diplomatic policies and international processes in influencing standards in global policy action. One of my examples or scenarios for this is the IFLA Public Library Manifesto. So when we talk about this um, recent public library manifesto that we have, um, it, is, it is libraries in diplomacy because librarians are trying to be involved in creating a manifesto to improve libraries, and to better libraries. Um, another example would be the sustainable development goals that is being um, you know, promoted by the, 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 the association as well, IFLA, the ALA Policy Core, and of course, um, not only non-state actors, but also state actors. We have a lot of this librarians, they call themselves as um, regional public engagement officers or information resource officers 
that is trying to work with the U.S. State Department, and they're also trying to influence and inform and create a participation in U.S. foreign policies. So I think it's a good idea right now that we, you know, um, we get involved in, in, in diplomatic engagement. And if we get involved, we are in this dimension. We are, you know, librarians in diplomacy. And then when we say diplomacy for libraries, it is more of a partnership from one library to another library. We're not talking about individual librarians here, but more of a association to association or um, li public library to public library through a sister library, library network program. Another, um, and then the main purpose for diplomacy for libraries is not to become an instrument for political agendas or for democratic ideals or for any agenda of the state or non-state actors, but it's more of to advance libraries, the core values of librarianship or, or to promote library cooperation. It's more of like improving library services. So that, that's what I, I defined it. For, for this particular dimension, the diplomacy for libraries. One of the example with which is, um, we have seen in the American Library Association that they have been, you know, creating um, engagement with, the, with their South American counterparts and the Central American and South American counterparts. And one of which is the ALA's partnership with Guadalajara. So they always partner every year to support this book fair. And it's not just about book fair because, you know, um, the American librarians go to Guadalajara to, to promote or to support the book fair, but also create programs that say, for example, exchange um, library skills. So they also promote library programs and services there. They exchange um, library skills that you know that is important, essential in this particular country, and then this Guadalajara uh, librarians also go to the United States to you know build relationship and promote more Spanish um, uh, Spanish uh, culture and Spanish collection and all that stuff. So it's more of like a partnership, and it's a two way partnership. And the main purpose is only to advance libraries and to improve libraries and services. The second um, app, uh, a scenario that I see is the this um, association or the library. Yeah, sure. Can, can we uh, uh, open wrap up and and open sure. up for questions here? Yeah, sure. Um, Go ahead. I'm just gonna be quick right now. Sorry, and um, yeah. So those, those are the diplomacy for libraries. And then the last they mentioned would be the libraries for diplomacy, which means that, you know, it's more of a um, libraries are being used as an instrument, being used as a tool, as a resource to create relationship or reinforce understanding um, in the international environment. So one of the best example for this is the one that I've mentioned in the paper one that I mentioned a while ago, the the partnerships of the American spaces abroad, the the the, the British Councils, the Alliance de Francais, the UNIC regional cooperation, and um, some also some academic libraries. Let's say for example, the um, the Mortensen Center for International Library Programs. So they're not just partnering to better improve libraries abroad, but they're partnering to create peace and understanding to create relationship and reinforce dialogue in other countries through libraries as an instrument. So that is libraries for diplomacy. So sorry if I talk too much. Uh -huh. I think let's let's dive into the questions if they have questions. Yeah. Excellent, excellent presentation, Randolph. Uh, we're gonna turn it over to uh, Stephen to lead us off here in uh, uh, discussion, Stephen. Randolph, right. you want to stop screen share? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't, we, we, we leave it up there. These are really interesting slides. <laughs> I, I, right. I fully recommend that. You, I apologize. I apologize I'm joining me right now from there. an airport. I'm on, on the way to speak at a library conference. So I, I guess I'm doing library diplomacy in some ways. Um, 
So first of all, I just want to say I, I'm, I know we've talked before, but um, I don't know you, you are doing my fantasy PhD as, as someone who sort of started doing international relations and ended up working for a library organisation. This is um, I don't know. This is it, it's I don't know. It's fascinating to see what you do theorised, um, and and slightly unnerving sometimes as well. <laughs> so it 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 it's 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 absolutely fascinating stuff. I think it's a really helpful way of making sure that not just me but I think anyone who gets involved internationally to think about why they're doing it and what's the setting they're actually involved in uh, beyond the personal reasons I think that professionally it's fascinating because you know as you say um, there's growing awareness of the role that, that the possibility to instrumentalize to use information to use d the digitalization of our world for political purposes in order to obtain things and so the need to actually think about well what are we doing there and, and can we actually come up with some sort of model that actually works better and is actually hopefully more focused on achieving individual ends and um, certainly you may well have read the materials that have recently come out of the UN on new agenda for peace and talking about there's a, a growing I guess selfishness desire to sort of seek your own ends, look after your own security, first of all. And of course, and that obviously comes true in the information space where this idea that information is a security space is probably stronger than ever. So I think that that makes this really interesting. At the same time, also some of the ideas about how you reform the UN also have a very strong, arguably library information focus to them. Um, so uh, in order to get, get into the questions actually, um, I think one thing that struck me in what you're talking about, and it's right at the beginning, and of course it's included in, in your paper, is actually when we talk about d diplomacy, what are we talking about? Uh, and, and I think, you know, that there's probably a line to be drawn between own interest, you know, self-interest and enlightened self-interest. Um, as I think a lot of the time, traditionally we tend to think of diplomacy, it's war by other means, it's a way of maximizing your own wealth or prestige or value in the world. And being slightly harsh, but I don't know, I work for a library organisation, so we love to dump on museums. Um, some of that sort of museum diplomacy feels a little bit like it, it, it's a marketing campaign. I don't know, being able to say that we're demonstrating showing our stuff in other countries works well for that purpose. However, the space of actually that more enlightened self-interest and trying to get involved in activities that promote the wider good, because in the end that will either trickle down to you or a more stable, greener, fair world is just good for us in general. I think that that sort of comes through. And so I think one angle I'm interested in is how you consider, for example, the place of libraries in global efforts. So in, for example, in the UNFCCC, the role of libraries in gathering information to actually address climate change, the role of libraries, for example, during the COVID pandemic, in terms of a space and infrastructure to share information across borders and actually make it possible to, to, to create a global knowledge commons in order to find global solutions. So how that fits in is one question. I think you, you talked a lot about the risks and the possibility of instrumentalization of libraries and, and, and how that is, is likely to feel distasteful. And, and I, I can understand that. I, I think that it's not as if you know, we, we don't necessarily agree with our governments all the time. Obviously, you know, in some countries we're allowed to say that and others we're not. Um, but um, th and th there's always going to be that little risk of instrumentalization. I suppose there's a question there about, is there therefore a risk for libraries in getting involved in more state-run processes? Um, is it possible to be involved in the state-run process but stay yeah. true to the idea that you're promoting more global values but yeah. I think also connected to that I promise there's only one more question after this is okay. there actually to what extent and, and I know we feel this a little bit within an organization like IFLA is there a risk in promoting a particular concept of libraries and just I don't know being blunt something based around first generation rights does that actually pose a risk to the ability of libraries which are more focused on second generation rights, like the right to education, the right to health, the right to employment and things like that. Do we actually ri pose a risk to that ability of libraries in other countries, which may not currently enjoy the same level of, of freedoms that we do in some parts of the world? So it, it, can we actually potentially cause damage by promoting 
something like that and actually take yeah. away from the potential to deliver something yeah. more real. Final question, metrics. I'd be fascinated about any inf- information you've had about metrics of success and the impact of live diplomacy. Yeah. And I will stop there. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of questions, right? So I think the first one would be, um, actually, that's the next slide. The thing that, you, just to like wrap up all the questions that you have mentioned. Um, What's really important with this research right now, particularly the third paper, I will not disclose where I'm gonna publish it, but because it's it's in the minor revisions right now, so I can't tell you guys. But um, the, the the main purpose of that third paper is for people, for librarians to know that they are involved in the implicit and the explicit side of library diplomacy. So when we talk about implicit, like we know that we're cooperating, right? We're 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 doing cooperation. We're doing engagement. We're we're I'm, I I have like sister library to another country, but we are we don't realize that what we do is diplomacy. So that is like the the unintentional way of like doing diplomacy. And a lot of like librarians, based on the the interview findings that I have, is that they have this implicit side of library diplomacy. They don't realize. That, that they're what they're doing is diplomatic engagement. Another thing is that a lot of like those who are explicit that they are involved with li- library diplomacy are those working in the state in the as political actors. So what is now the um, the morals of the story? It means that we need to know which are we? Are we in the implicit side? Are we are we in the explicit side? Because if we are all in the explicit side of library diplomacy, then we know if we are being becoming an instrument or becoming a tool only for political agendas. But if we know that you know library diplomacies exist and we are intentional in our goals in agenda to promote equity, diversity, and inclusion, to promote you, you mentioned a while ago, gener- second generation rights and all that stuff. Then we have, we can avoid, you know, a lot of this instrumentalization of political actors about for, about libraries. So yeah, I forgot all the 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 questions that you've mentioned, but you've mentioned about metrics. Um, so one of the best practices um, is that uh, that I found. Is the, the 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 program of the Mortensen Center for International Library Programs in University of um, Illinois Urbana-Champaign? So they are situated in the library in a university library setting, and of course they they advance the goals and the motives and the um, the agenda of of their university as a as a public institution. But this Mortensen Center, they're also promoting peace and understanding. They're creating you know, um, engagement and dialogue without any intervention of a political agenda. But they are promoting, you know, things that are outside the, li- the, the, the university library world. So I think it's one of the best practices. It's because first, some of them are explicit. They know that what they do is diplomacy, meaning um, they know that, you know, they are partnering with one country to another to better and advanced libraries, so which is really good. What is really bad is some some I will not mention, but some um, um, some library practices is that um, they engage with cooperation with this particular country or particular institution, but they don't realize that what they do is just a political agenda. Meaning they 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 don't gain much in that cooperation, but they gain less. But the, the host institution or the host country gain more, right? So again, and then and then this particular institution or librarians, they are not aware. They are unaware of their role in this diplomatic engagement. So that is the the, the, the danger side of, of the library diplomacy spectrum. So I hope like everyone should be explicit. We should be intentional in in in. In, in, in influencing or informing or creating relationship with one country to another. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, 
<laughs> you this this last comment made me think one of your statistics was uh uh the ratio of uh propaganda out outward projected uh communication with cross cultural was 3 to 1 <laughs> so yeah. it seems like that's the uh, uh the higher priority for most yeah. countries but it's not just nation states. Uh, no. You know, you make me realize we're doing kind of library diplomacy here within the U.S. across different uh, state uh, approaches. So best practices shared. Oh, yeah, you do it that way. OK, this is how we handle COVID and so on and so forth. Um, it's also a, a, this this point Stephen made about uh, second generation or would promoting. I mean, are there core principles of librarianship that are common that are not necessarily considered propaganda like you know freedom of reading of of privacy of uh you know as opposed to the you know freedom of speech which may be more controversial yeah. where does that where does that sort of commonality leave off to uh things that would be then considered controversial or, or political yeah, so um, in terms of my um, interview findings, what I found is that um, they, a lot of these librarians or library leaders working in international engagement and diplomatic influence, they are there. It's not just only because to promote the policy of their university or the policy of their nation state, but it's more of to create and facilitate knowledge dialogue. So to facilitate, let's say, for example, what you've mentioned, the inf uh, information freedom, to create an understanding about that, to create an understanding about copyright issues. What are the copyright issues from one country to another? And let's, you know, let's talk about this and let's share our best practices to improve our copyright policies in our countries. Another thing is about open access. Some of them are just there to facilitate this knowledge dialogue to create understanding about open access. Some of them... Let's say, for example, um, this particular institution, they're, they're state actors, but they're there to promote creativity. They want to promote innovation. They want to promote more, you know, maker spaces, more hackathons or more, you know, emerging uh, digital tools and resources in the library to better improve the libraries. So it's more of knowledge dialogue. So that's one of the things that I saw in the identities of these actors is that um, they are not politicians and they're not, you know, they are not a statist, rather, that only follows the foreign policy. But most of them are there to promote, even though they are state actors, they promote the core values of librarianship or the core principles of librarianship, which, which is to facilitate knowledge dialogue. Yeah, Stephen makes an interesting point about uh, science as a vehicle for diplomacy, and yeah. you know it has a history of a common set of principles: empirical, you know, investigation, uh, uh, hopefully without bias, you know, yeah. in a in a world of science. And so, I think you know libraries are are less uh, explicit in their practices than science. But it's it's a clear basis for interaction across uh, straight lines. The the notion of collective learning in the field of librarianship is something I think you know we we can all deal with. So something comes up, COVID. We all need to learn about that at the same time. AI has come up. Can we all engage on that? It affects everybody. So yeah. can we create a, a vehicle? for learning, which constitutes a type of diplomacy just by knitting us together as fellow students of a subject or uh, fellow explorers in a new area. So this is really fascinating. We've run over a few minutes, but you know this is not a TV show, so we're not really bound <laughs> by that. People are free to leave, uh, and they do, of course, have uh, other uh, obligations. What, what you reminded me of, uh, I go back a bit, <laughs> was uh, the uh, the early engagement with China and the US and it was ping pong diplomacy. Yeah. So it was a way to open the door with a common activity, non-threatening, uh, 
you know, ping pong. And yeah. and yet it it engaged people's minds because it's a relatively simple activity that people can understand. It wasn't threatening it and and it created a basis for engagement, which really was extremely important as it turned yeah. out. So it's like is so the the you you make the point about the 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 challenge or the risk of uh, libraries becoming vehicles for state policies for national politics to export. So that seemed like a very careful line we want to draw uh, uh, between libraries, what libraries would do on their own, and what they would do if they had the support of national governments. Yeah, Stephen. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, really interesting, challenging comments and questions you posed for us to pick up when we after he publishes this mysterious publication. I was going to say, to be honest, I think we could make a whole series out of this. There's so many things to dig into. Yeah, but I know. Well, well, let's let Randolph finish the finish the PhD first, <laughs> get everything published, and then open that one. Jumping but, the gun a little bit, but I think it was well, worthwhile to get the basis. Yeah, uh, oh, no, 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 and and I'd, I'd love actually to see. Now, but as a personal objective here, but actually making the connection between the science diplomacy crowd and you, because I think there's a huge amount of commonality in there about the role yeah. of data and information. And which is often overseen or overlooked yeah. or taken for granted in the science field. So actually making that explicit as well would be a really powerful thing. If I may add something. Um, so in the science diplomacy, what they promote in terms of like how to identify themselves as like science diplomat is creating this image of trust that we need to trust on science and not on politics. So those are like the things that I like, I admire with the science diplomacy side. And I hope that in the library diplomacy side too, because we hold the information. We are the ones who's like trying to build connections with one library to another library or to the other wider public to know our in to the information that we have, right? So I think that we that power that we have, the information or the data or the knowledge that we have is our power asset to build trust. And that trust is diplomacy already. So just to already. debunk the idea that diplomacy is more of like a political, it's it's not anymore. In the contemporary side, it's more of the new public diplomacy, which is involves non-state actors like scientists, librarians, or museum creators in terms of building trust to the whole international system. Yeah. Great, great, great point, and and a great goal. So, I think Stephen's right. There, there are a lot of branches of this, and uh, a, a lot to explore. So, once you're public, <laughs> you're kind of public today. But once you're officially public, Randolph, we'll we'll reengage and sure. and see what's going. Uh, one question for you, and maybe we can close, and you can also make any uh, final comments you'd like is what kind of responses are you getting from diplomats, from formal diplomats that are in this business of engaging on all these different levels? Yeah. So there's like two kinds of like diplomats that probably you're talking about. First is librarians is working as a diplomat. Probably, let's say, for example, State Department librarians or like this information resource officers. And the second one is like the general path, you know, gene they call it, um, diplomats who are in the general path or direction. So they could be political diplomats or like economic diplomats or cultural diplomacy diplomats. So the first one, um, they, they, they are happy, of course, <laughs> because they, they, <laughs> they um, um, because in this research, they would be able to share in the world that they are important. And what they do and the skills that they have is important in the 21st century because, you know, we need library diplomacy and, and, and partnership because there's no country or no government or no institution can address real world problems and can stand alone, right? We need to have partners. We have to have allies and we have to have cooperation. And those are the things that this State Department librarians are currently doing. They're creating relationships, partnerships through diplomacy. The second one, the, the political side, um, they are curious. 
on what can librarians can do or share or support in the diplomatic engagement because one one diplomat that I have interviewed he she said that diplomacy is not working as of the moment and as I mentioned a while ago there's a lot of like conflicts and wars happening all over the world like I will not mention it all of this but you know that it's happening it means that diplomacy is not happening trust is not there and then partnership is not there or mutual understanding and dialogue is not there. So they hope that librarians, scientists, museum creators, cultural actors can be involved in this diplomatic engagement because um, diplomacy cannot work only with this political actors. They need us in the cultural side, the library side, the museum or the archive side to help them build and create relationships and cooperation. That's great. And, and you, you know, of course you mentioned trust as a, uh, as a sort of objective of diplomacy to build trust. What better institution to start with than the one that's the most trusted of our institutions? I mean, they're about that, the building the trust in their communities at the community level uh, and the opportunity for a global network of, I believe IFLA uh, estimates around 400,000 public libraries in the world. Yeah. What a great vehicle for knitting together all these cultures and, and environments in our common um, uh, challenges, which we have increasingly common challenges. Yeah. Randolph, thank you so much. Uh, this thank has just so been much. really fascinating, thought provoking. Uh, any final word or, you know, we want to save it for the next time. Um, yeah, I hope that we, we could continue the conversation about right. this and, um, and that would be able to like share to you the, 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 my results for my third paper, which is the, the last paper for my dissertation that talks about what is the, the identity and the values, the goals and the strategy being used by this people that I've interviewed experts in diplomacy, both in library information science and international relations field, what do they talk about library diplomacy and how do they want to use library diplomacy in their own practice? And I hope that I'd be able to share to you that um, 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 results. Yeah. Good. Well, we look And thank you for that. listening. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, I think with that, we will, uh, we will close and welcome you back and and thank you and thank everybody for participating this uh, recording will be up shortly for people that weren't able to get here today uh, we get about as many people uh, view these after the fact as uh, as participate so in this case i think it'll be more all right with that we'll close out and thanks again randolph and good luck thank you